Okay, again, the topic today is uh, the Holy Spirit, and I want to, uh, specifically this, we say in the Nicene Creed that the Holy Spirit spoke by the prophets, and, uh, and so we uh, speak of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit uh, through the scriptures, and that will be our, uh, our theme for today, these passages where the Holy Spirit uh, inspires the Holy Scripture. So uh, I'm in my... What is this thing called? Dictionary of Bible Themes. The Holy Spirit inspired the writing of the scripture. Uh, and the first verse that it goes to is really quite wonderful. It's here, 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 to 2. And these are what's called the last words of David. What I, I thought about, um, for, for a, how come that's going sideways? Let me try this. The last words, of, there we go. Uh, I thought about doing a study on the last words of David uh, with Martin Luther. I thought that would be a kind of amazing study to consider, but I, we'll, we'll do Jacob. That'll be great also. But, um, but this is a wonderful, uh, if you have a, a way to get a hold of Luther on the last words of David, it's great. One of my professors said that Luther's commentary on the last words of David is all you need to read to learn how to read the Bible. Because... It's so theological, it's so clear, it's tr so Trinitarian. In other words, that we, we, you know, we, how do we normally think? We think that the Old Testament is maybe about God who's big and good and mad. But that's what we know about God from nature. That's the revealed knowledge of God. But we know so much more of God in the Old Testament. We've already been looking at this already. That we see that God is Father, um, Son, and Holy Spirit, and and so we we have the doctrine of the Trinity. We are we have the doctrine that the Son will become a man, the incarnation, that He will die and rise, so the death and resurrection of Jesus, and that this will be the price for our salvation. So we already we have already the creed and everything there in the Old Testament. It's it's. I I think Saint Augustine said, in the Old Testament, we we find like the Trinity concealed in the New Testament it's revealed. I do not like that saying of Augustine. There might be some wisdom in it, but I do not like it because we have a. We we. We, we are tempted to think that the Old Testament is a, uh, a Jewish book and the New Testament is a Christian book. No, 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 no. That's, this is not the case. This is the same doctrine all the way through. And so Luther's commentary on the last words of David is really a profound, it's, a, it's 150 pages or something. I, I've been working through it. I, I think I have a public domain version that I'm trying to republish. It's just great. Okay, so these are the last words of David. Now, by the way, they're not his last words, but they're his last official words. It's like this is his last sermon. It's David's last sermon. The oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of a man who was raised on high, so exalted to king, the anointed of the God of Jacob, so he was Messiah, he was, he was king, the sweet psalmist of Israel, that's a beautiful name for King David, the sweet psalmist, because while there was a bunch of psalmists, nine David was the chief of the psalmists. And it's an important thing for us to remember whenever we're reading through the like Old Testament uh, uh, prophets that so many of them are preaching on the psalms of David. That was their texts. It's great. And then look what David says. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. So the Holy Spirit is God. That's what that means, right? Let's highlight that. The Spirit of Yahweh, the God of Israel, are the same. The rock of Israel, that's Jesus, has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass spout forth from the earth. So David has this special instruction from the Lord about being king. Um, and, it, and so we have the, 
We have the Spirit, we have the Father, and we have the Son, all spoken here. But it's the Spirit of the Lord who speaks by me. So when we say in the Creed, he speaks by the prophets, this is one of the texts that, we, that we're leaning on. I wonder if I could find... I wonder if I could, if it's, I wonder if I can find what Luther says about this super quick. Commentary, Luther's Works, Volume 15. Yeah, here's a couple paragraphs from Luther. We can look at that. Let me make it bigger. Here David begins to speak too strangely and loftily for me. God grant that I may understand at least a bit, uh, 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 at least a bit in spite of that, for he here begins to talk about the exalted Holy Trinity, the divine essence. For in the first place, he mentions the Holy Spirit. To him he ascribes all that is foretold by the prophets. And to this and similar verses, St. Peter refers, 2 Peter 2, or 1 21, where he says, No prophecy ever came by the impulse of man, but moved by the Holy Spirit, holy men of God spoke. Therefore, we sing in the article the Creed concerning the Holy Spirit who spake by the prophets. That's the Nicene Creed. And nice how Luther talks about how we sing the Creed. I kind of like that. Thus we attribute to the Holy Spirit all of Holy Scripture and the external word and the sacraments which touch and move our external ears and other senses. Our Lord Jesus Christ also ascribes his word to the Holy Spirit when he quotes Isaiah 61. We looked at that last week in Luke 4. 11, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. As he quotes Isaiah 42 in Matthew 12, Behold my servant whom I am chosen, I will put my spirit upon him. And in Luke 1, 35, we read that the Holy Spirit will overshadow Mary and will touch her, take her blood and impregnate her, so that the Lord is described as conceived by the Holy Ghost. What a glorious and arrogant arrogance it is for anyone to dare to boast that the Spirit of the Lord speaks through him and that his tongue is voicing the word of the Holy Spirit. In other words, Luther is saying that this, what David says, is an incredibly bold thing to say. You, wouldn't just, you can't just say that kind of stuff unless it's true. He must obviously be sure of his ground. David, son of Jesse, born in sin, Psalm 51, in sin my mother conceived me, is not such a man, but it is he who has been called to be a prophet by the promise of God. Should he who has such a teacher to instruct him and speak through him not be able to compose sweet psalms? Let him who has ears to hear, hear. My speech is really not mine. But he who hears me hears God. And he who despises me despises God. Compare that with Luke 10, where Jesus sends out his apostles, the 70, and says, whoever hears you hears me. For I foresee that many of my descendants will not give ear to my word. This is, my here is David, right? will not give ear to my word, and they will redound to their great detriment. So here, Luther, who, who he likes to do this, likes to put words in the mouth of King David. So here he's putting words in the, expanding what he's preaching. Neither do we nor anyone else who is not a prophet, sorry, neither we nor anyone else who is not a prophet may claim to such an honor. So notice how Luther says, I, Luther, am not a prophet. I'm a pastor. A preacher of the Lord's word. I'm not inspired by the... Now, who does claim, lay claim to such an honor? The Pope. Don't get me started. But Luther says, no, we, we make no such claim that we have a special gift of the Holy Spirit to speak directly from God. But we may do this. Sorry, where did I go? But we may do this as far as we are holy and possess the Holy Spirit, namely in that we can boast of being catechumens and pupils of the apostles, in that we repeat and preach what they have heard and learned from the prophets and apostles and are convinced that the prophets taught this. In the Old Testament, such people are called sons of the prophets. They do not promulgate anything of their own or proclaim anything new as the prophets do, but they teach what they receive from the prophets. They are, as David says, Israel for whom he writes his psalms. This is so great. So uh, so th just to remind, uh, remind us of this doctrine uh, here, is that you have, you have the call of God which comes directly to people. That's the immediate call. 
the unmediated call, and that belongs to the prophets and to the apostles. And then you have the mediated call, and that's through the church, or whatever, but through the church. And that's where you get sons of the prophets and pastors. And our job, these guys spoke directly from God. That's their, that's their work, is to what God gives, they speak. But the, the sons of the apostles, sorry, the sons of the prophets and the pastors preach the apostolic word. They bring that forth from the teaching of the prophets and the apostles. It's great. Perfect. Okay, questions about that? That's kind of nice. This Luther on the last words of David, that's really quite something. This will be fun. So this is a little bit of what I hope to do. If you're, if you're just jumping in late, I, uh, my plan for, for our next study is the life of Jacob with Luther. And so we'll look at, we'll look at Luther's commentary on these kinds of things as well. So the Spirit, but this is the point. This is the point. The Holy Spirit spoke by the prophets. So the Holy Spirit inspired King David. Let's just take a look at some of these verses real quick because I got about five minutes. Nehemiah 9.30. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your Spirit through your prophets. There it is. See it? The Spirit spoke through the prophets, yet they would not give ear. Next verse. Ezekiel 2.2. And he spoke to me, and as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me this very day. Or, let's take... Well, someone says, this directly contradicts the Pentecostal. Exactly. That idea of the mediated call versus the immediate call, Lois, is... is is very important for our conversation with the Pentecostal church because they say that everyone has an immediate call. And that's why, by the way, have you ever noticed, I mean, whenever we talk about, say, women in ministry, which is a big topic, I suppose, although it's, it just seems so clear in the scriptures that it just needs to crucify our own minds, but uh, the Pentecostals had women pastors before the liberals did, before the progressive Christians did. So there was women preaching in the Pentecostal church before there was women preaching in like the mainline denominations. And why is because they have this idea of the immediate call. If someone is called by the Holy Spirit, how, how can you get in the way? So that the Holy Spirit still gives these gifts immediately rather than understanding the gift to be mediated through the church and the, therefore the office of teacher and pastor is, an, is a an office of being under. It's an office of submission to the Word of God. Um, let's see. Uh, pastors become less of a, Barb says, pastors become less an identifying title these days. Anyone can call oneself a pastor. You can get a uh, ordination certificate on the internet for like 50 bucks and go to a wedding. Shame, shame. Uh, Sarah says, in the Bible reading plan I'm following, one of the comments is that the Holy Spirit has talked about being on people in the Old Testament and then in people in the New Testament after the resurrection. I should That's an interesting thing. The Holy Spirit will speak of on and in. I believe we can find that language in both Old and New Testament. And... Um, And so I don't think that's an Old Testament, New Testament distinction. But I, I, I might, Sarah, is, um, remind me, and I'll try to look up a, uh, I'll try to look that up. Let's do a couple more verses before I got a rocket ship out of here. Um, are we in Micah now? Micah 3, verse 8. But as for me, I am filled with power with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice, that's a uh, mishpat, and might. Huh. Normally it's justice and righteousness, but here mishpat and right. To declare to Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. Can you guys hear the organ and trumpet, by the way, in the background? 
They're practicing in there. It sounds great. I don't know if you guys can hear it. So here Micah says the Holy Spirit is on me. Zechariah 7, 12. Uh, they made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words that the Lord of hosts, that Yahweh Sabaoth, has sent by his spirit through the previous, through the former prophets. Therefore, great anger came from the from Yahweh of Sabaoth. So, so here we have, uh, again, the Spirit speaking through the prophets. This is, so this is just nice to get this. When we talk about the inspiration of the Holy Scripture, the Holy Spirit spoke by the prophets. And this is confirmed by the New Testament. So let's look at 2 Timothy 3.16. The most important of, uh, perhaps, um, the most important of the Bible verses that talk about the nature of the Holy Scripture. So, so St. Paul writes here, all Scripture, all Scripture, and this is going to include for us Old Testament and New Testament, Pasagrafe, all writings, uh, is breathed out by God. That in the Greek is one word, theopanoimates. And this is a beautiful word. Let me make this bigger over here. Uh, the, the word in the Greek is right here. It's one word. And let me just draw. So, theo, that's the word for God, theos. And panumatos, that's the word for spirit or breath or breathe. So this would be very literally translated, all writings, so and understood here in context, the Holy Scriptures, are, are God-spirited, theopanoimatos, the, uh, one word there combined in the Greek. It's only used here. In fact, it might only, it might be, Pastor Nauman might be able to look this up, but I believe that that word is only here in the scriptures and maybe only here in the whole universe. Uh, that this might be a, a, a word that Paul himself uh, invented uh, to describe it. Um, I, I, I should have probably, before I make claims like that, I should probably look it up just to see. But this is long on the spirit. Uh, I probably can't find it. There it is. Okay, here it is. Theopanoimatos. This word is used... Oh, i got to make this bigger. This word is used for the wisdom or dreams that come from God. New Testament occurs only in 2 Timothy 3.16, where along with sacred, it describes the Old Testament writings of divine authority. Also New Testament. Whoever's writing this is a big lib. Uh, in the Hellenistic word, the idea of inspiration is common to seldom refers to writings. In Judaism, however, God inscribed the commandments on tablets. Inspired the prophets. The law being taught. Mm. Philo, philo, sorry, I'm just. Philo regard. I, I, I don't think that uses the word in those texts in the Septuagint. The law being taught, dictated, or written directly by God has supreme authority, but later works being inspired by God have secondary authority. Philo regards all the Old Testament authors as prophets. That's nice. Philo is more orthodox than the guy writing this article. Um, ah, that's fine. It doesn't confirm. Maybe Pastor Nauman will be able to track that down. I, I, this is, it, it is a very unique uh, word for describing the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures. So all Scripture is God-spirited and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correcting, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God, and this is probably the pastor here, but we can all take it as a gift for us too. Man of God may be talos, complete. Um, I'm just making sure. Equipped. For every good work. Uh, so this is really great. And I here's how I remember this text. Uh, and I don't know if this is helpful, but I, I remember I made this mnemonic back in high school to try to remember 
teaching, reproof, correction, and training. It's not a mnemonic, it's a picture. But So the, we're, we're trying to walk the right way. That's teaching. And then uh, if we go wrong, then that's where reproof comes in. And then we have to be brought back to the right spot. That's where correction is. And then we need to grow in righteousness. That's where training in righteousness. So this is how I remember these four things. I, 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 teaching, rebuke, correction, training in righteousness. One, two, three, four. Maybe that'll help you guys to remember this. Because this verse should be memorized. It's a, it's a good memory verse that's here. All Scripture is breathed out by God, theopanoimatos, and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. That righteousness is, of course, the righteousness of the forgiveness of sins and the righteousness of good works that follow. That the man of God may be complete. This is thoroughly equipped. This is like... um. It's like the soldier, the description here is like the soldier who has all his army, his gear on. He's got his helmet, he's got his shield, he's got his sword ready to go, he's got his belt, he's got his, his shoes on, so that he's ready and equipped for the battle. Okay. There's a few more verses that, that would be great to look at, so you guys can jot these down. 2 Peter 1, that's the maybe the key one. Maybe we'll finish this next week. No prophecy comes from man's own desires. Um, uh, some other verses that are there. Uh, these will be really great to take a look at uh, also. But I've got to go to a ribbon cutting. Ha! Huh, so sorry to cut it short. It's even, it always goes fast. And I guess it goes even faster when it's only when it's only 28 minutes. But thank you guys for your um, for your attention. Let me close with a prayer. I'll stop the recording. I'll hand it over to Pastor Nauman, and and then we can see what happens there. But let's pray. Oh Lord, we give you thanks that you inspired the prophets and the apostles to to give and to bless us with your word. We pray that you would give us joy in the reading and hearing and the comfort of your truth. For we ask all of this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.